seated, please. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we didn't plan it that way, or did we plan it that way? I didn't plan it that way, but um, one of the verses that Keith shared with you are one of these two that we're going to read um, again today. I want to talk about singing today. Um, and those of you who know me, I'm certainly not going to give you any instruction on how to sing and probably not even going to give you a demonstration um, of singing, and you'll all be blessed because of that. Um, but I do want to talk about singing and something that's true almost universally. If I ask you this question, um, and I don't know if anybody would, maybe some people do, I always say I'm not a singer, but I sing sometimes. What makes you sing? When do you sing? One of the times I sing a lot is at Christmas. I, like most people, I love the Christmas songs. I love that there are some radio stations that change their whole format to have nothing but Christmas songs. I like some of the Christmas hymns and things like that, but there's a handful of songs. Some of them uh, I find as I get older, the songs I like get older um, as well. Some of you may can identify with that, but even on brand new songs, occasionally there's one that's catchy or whatever, but um, I would ask, when do you sing? And maybe more importantly, what do you sing about? Now, I know there's sometimes we just sing nonsense things, like we don't really know why we like a certain song. We just find ourselves singing the words. And sometimes as you start breaking down the words you're singing, you go, oh, I don't think I ought to be singing that. I didn't realize what that song said. Um, but we sing about all kinds of things. And some of the ones that came to mind historically is I bet most of you know this song about blue suede shoes. Doesn't that seem like an odd thing um, to sing about? Um, what about a pink Cadillac? You ever heard that song? You sing about that? Or what about this one? A yellow submarine. Those are all weird things. Now, as I looked at the lyrics to those, they all may be a little different. Blue suede shoes, in fact, I even read um, that... Um, uh, Carl Perkins wrote that song, and it was literally about blue suede shoes. There's no real hid hidden meaning in that. He was watching some people dance while he was performing, and um, somebody, a, a girl stepped on a guy's blue suede shoes, and he said, hey, stay off of my suede. And so he uh, was encouraged to write a song. Of course, Elvis Presley made that famous and actually wore those shoes that were in that picture. I think the pink Cadillac song is about a pink Cadillac, but it's more about the owner of the pink Cadillac from the person who's singing it. And um, Yellow Submarine has always um, intrigued me a little bit. And um, I don't know whether you're aware of this or not, but a lot of people think that song is about drug use. Um, shocking, I know, coming from the Beatles. But um, we sing about things that are either part of our life, important to us, or maybe even things that make us happy. And if you looked even at the top 40 today, you would find some things like uh, Ed Sheeran sings a song right now called, I'm in love with the shape of you. There's no real hidden meaning in that song, is there? Um, in fact, Bruno Mars, who if you watch the Super Bowl halftime show, that's the little bitty guy, Bruno Mars. Um, he has a song right now, and it's called, That's What I Like. And he lists a whole lot of things. And um, again, there is a person he's trying to persuade to, um, to join him in those things that he likes. But it's things like diamonds and pink champagne on ice and trips to Puerto Rico and shopping in Paris. We just sing about what we like. Well, why do we sing? Why do Christians sing? Uh, if you notice, you flip through your hymn book, there's not a lot of things about jewelry and trips and things like that. In fact, there's not a lot of songs in there about our relationship with each other. There's not love songs by a strict definition, and there's not songs about um, material things as much, at least not in a positive light. So why do we sing and what do we sing? Well, I think... Um, I read a story, a backstory of one of the hymns that maybe is not the most familiar of hymns, but there's a guy named Charles Wesley who wrote a whole lot of hymns that are in our hymn book and lots of other people's hymnals. He wrote a song called Jesus, Lover of My Soul. And the story goes like this, that um, Charles Wesley was... Um, near the coast on uh, a day when a storm was really raging um, and people were fearful of the strength of that storm and kind of looked in dread as this storm was approaching from the sea. And on that morning, dimly way out into the harbor, he could see a ship that was struggling and helplessly floundering in that storm. 
The passengers were even uh, some abandoning ship and trying to reach the land lest they die on that little ship. But many were being drowned in the tempest of that sea. And Charles Wesley, when he opened his window to get a better view of what was going on out there as the rain was sort of coming down that window, a little tiny bird came rushing through the window and came right into uh, under his coat uh, that he was wearing at the time. And a hawk that was chasing it just turned away before uh, that bird took shelter under his coat. And under the inspiration of these two pictures there, he wrote this song. And these are some of the words of that song. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O my Savior, hide, till the storm of life be past. Safe into the haven guide, O receive my soul at last. What do Christians sing about? They sing about those kind of things. I hope you know that song has nothing to do with ships and birds. To him, that moment was a picture of the salvation that God has offered to his people, that God has reached down to those who are perishing and has saved them from certain death, and that he's offered a safe haven for those that are pursued and hounded and under the threat of their life. That's a picture of salvation. That's what makes us sing. At least I hope that's what makes you sing. So if we ask that question, why do we sing? The first and foremost, the answer has to be this. Uh, it comes as a direct command from Scripture. Let's read uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Those two verses say this. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So one simple answer to that question is, why should I sing? The answer would be because God said so. Look at what he says in one other place. Our obedience to God demands that we sing. And do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another. Listen to that. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Notice that that has to do with our singing together. Because we could make a, a, a case for private worship. Should you sing songs to and about God in your own private moments? You absolutely should. But here in Ephesians, and I think by extension in our Colossian verse, it says that we should do that together because God says that we should. That there should be such gratitude in our hearts. And there's something special about the people of God singing together. So that's the starting place. But let me give you just a, a couple of quick things. Why we sing. First, singing helps us remember God's word. It helps us remember what God has said to us. What has God said to us? We have a whole Bible full of God's word. And the, the verse that we read from Colossians says that the word of God will dwell in us richly. And it says one of the ways in which it can dwell in us is by psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Songs whose lyrics expound the person, the work, and the glory of Christ tend to stay with us long after we've forgotten the main points of a sermon. That's a reality I'm well aware of. How many have ever memorized one of my sermons? Me either. I don't memorize them. I have notes that I use every Sunday. But I bet you know lots of songs, don't you? And I bet you know lots of songs that include the truths of the Scripture. Do you know the choir anthem this morning? Um, I memorized it, not because they sang it, because I know that um, Bible verse that they were singing. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And they add, teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord. 
That's Isaiah 40, 31. It's almost an exact quote of that verse that they sang to us this morning. Why do we sing those kind of things? Not just have people sing them to us. I learned that verse by singing it like I did many, many Bible verses because it helps us to remember God's word. So we're being obedient to God, but we're also benefiting ourselves and each other as we recount the truths of God together. So I want you to make it like a declaration of truth. Every time we stand to sing in this room, we are saying we believe these words. And by and large, most of what we sing is either directly from or based directly on God's word. Why do we sing? Because it helps us to remember God's word. Secondly, singing helps us to respond to God's grace. I've hinted at that already. If you understand what God has done for you, it's the kind of thing that we sing about. You ever had a coworker, a friend, a classmate, anybody like that, and they come in and there's a little bounce in their step and they're whistling or they're singing? What's the question that almost comes? What's got into you today? What you so happy about today? Singing seems to belie something that's in us that's going on. And if we respond to God's grace, not in any particular uh, one style or um, music but in all kinds of ways, it seems like that's an appropriate response to, response to what God has done in us, through us, and for us. We are told in the verses that we read to sing with thankfulness to God in your hearts. Singing's meant to be a wholehearted activity. There's nothing worse than emotionless singing. In fact, that's an oxymoron. You can't sing emotionally. You may be saying words rhythmically, but if you don't feel them with your heart, I think real musicians would say that's not music if it doesn't touch the heart and touch the soul. God gave us singing to combine objective truth, something that can be clearly identified, We could say objective truth with our thankfulness. Some people call it doctrine and devotion. The things that are true with the things that we feel. And when they come together, a song comes out. Our intellect and our emotion both engaged in that. We don't want to sing mindless words that don't lift our hearts to know the truth of God. But we also don't want to sing great words without that part of our heart. So it helps us respond to God's grace. It also, singing helps us to share the gospel. We build each other up. Did you notice verse 16 in Colossians 3 said, teach and admonish one another. That sounds like a separate thing that in the church we would say we should teach, we should admonish, and we should sing. But listen to what it says. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There's a way in which our singing ought to, to share the gospel is if I'm saying I am saved by God's grace and I sing amazing grace is this if I'm punching you with my elbow next to me and saying I'm talking about God's grace are you hearing this are you getting this I'm telling you what the truth of the gospel is and I'm doing it in song and we do it together here every Sunday It's also an opportunity with what we sing um, to proclaim the truth to those who maybe don't know the truth of the gospel, those who have not accepted Jesus Christ. Just think about what we've sung as we've gathered here today. We started with our first hymn with Let There Be Praise. We said we should be praising God here together. And then we sang praise to God, praise to the Lord the Almighty. And we sang how great is our God. And anybody who's present here this morning, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, every one of us who sang that song together is saying to you, we believe that God is worthy of our praise because he is great, he is the savior of sinners, and that is worth hearing. And I want you to hear that. And so I hope that just when our mouths move here, we're not just doing some obligatory participation in a time filler until we get to a more important part of the service, but we are doing what is important. We are proclaiming the truth of God's word and the gospel itself. Last thing, singing helps us reflect God's glory. It says that we should do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That implies that everything we do would bring glory to God. Ephesians 5.19 says, Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. It is to Him and about Him that we sing. 
Isn't that true that people, uh, there are, if, if you did a Google search of um, song titles with the word love in them, there's almost an infinite amount of songs. Why is that? Because people are fascinated and in awe of all kinds of love. We have something that we sing about that's even greater than any human love that we could acknowledge. It's the divine love that comes from the creator uh, and Lord of this universe. And we sing to and about him because it's important. In fact, it's what will take place in heaven. Um, I think I've said this to you before. You could look at our gatherings like this this morning as just a choir practice for when we get to heaven. Because listen to what Revelation says uh, about eternity. The Apostle John describes a glimpse of eternity with a great multitude of people from every tribe, people, and language singing before the Lamb. Revelation 5, uh, 7, 9, and 10 says, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the lyrics of a song that we'll be singing in heaven together. Here on earth, we should be preparing for that day. It shouldn't be uncommon to us to sing the praises to God and how great it will be to get to sing them one day face to face with our Savior. The one to whom we have sung about, now we get to sing to. Uh, and our faith will be sight on that day. Here's what one person said. So, uh, worshiping God in song isn't simply a nice idea or only for musically gifted people. Let me read that part again, just in case you missed it. Worshiping God in song isn't simply a nice idea or only for musically gifted people. It's not just for the musically gifted. The question is not, has God given me a voice, but has God given me a song? And there's something in us is if I don't realize the greatness of God, if I don't realize the truth of him giving his only son on my behalf, if that doesn't well up within me a song that has to be sung, then maybe I don't know God in the way that he wants to be known, in the way that he needs to be known. David wrote a psalm about that. Psalm 40 says this, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and set my feet on the rock. He's talking about his salvation. David was saved physically from his enemies many, many times, but I think there's a place of salvation he's talking about here. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. David says, I waited patiently for deliverance. God hears him, rescues him, and one of the things he does for him in his deliverance is he puts a new song in his mouth. Friends, today, I hope you have that new song in you. And if you're like me, I don't fancy myself as any kind of singer whatsoever. But I want to implore you on behalf of the gospel to be one who acknowledges that new song in you. And when we stand to sing, particularly when we're gathered here together, that you sing heartily and faithfully and passionately, not because it sounds so good coming out of our mouth, because it's a song in our heart that has to be sung. It has to be told. The greatness of God, the glory of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit rules and reigns in us. And evidently, this isn't a new struggle for the church to always remember that it's that kind of singing. In the year 1742, John Wesley, Charles' brother, Charles is the one that wrote that hymn we mentioned earlier, John, who was his brother, who was a pastor, gave five rules for singing in the church. Um, some of these we wouldn't quite be so blunt today, but maybe we all need to hear these. Um, he, his first one was two words, sing all. And what he means is every one of you should be singing. The second, he says, sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Thirdly, sing modestly. Now, here's a word for me. Do not bawl so as to be heard above or distinct from the rest of the congregation, but strive to uni unite your voices together so as to make one clear, melodious sound. So I'm not trying to be heard. I'm not afraid of being heard, but I'm trying to sing together. There's a picture in that of uniting our voices as we unite our hearts. Then he says this, and this may be a challenge for some of us. Sing in time. 
Whatever time is sung, be sure to keep with it. Don't run before nor stay behind it. Maybe that's the biggest challenge for some of us. But lastly, and this is the most important thing, it's what we've been saying here. Above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. In order to do this, attend strictly to the sense of what you sing and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound that is offered to God. Or, and see that your heart is not carried away with the sound, but offered to God continually. You know what he says? Sing that song that's in your heart. Do it to the glory of God. Do it for the audience of God. And do it with all your might. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father. I want to put a plea in this new year as part of our emphasis. I want us to emphasize the good news of the gospel and all that we do. And it starts even with our singing here. Proclaim that good news. I'm going to give you a good chance to do that. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing how great thou art. We're going to start with two verses before the Lord's Supper and then another verse afterward. There's not a better song to sing of the greatness of God. The second verse that we're going to sing, I want you to hear the gospel in that about being a sinner and being saved by grace. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, it is with great joy that we gather here today. It is with great joy that we sing of the mercies of God, of the grace given to us in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would impress upon us uh, not just the opportunity and the obligation for song, but the privilege that it is to uh, proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in what we sing. And so I pray uh, that we could not hold back with that kind of praise to you today and every day. And so we give Give these things to you. We pray that your word, your command would be impressed upon us this day. Give us the power to respond in full obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.